Good evening, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us this evening for the final session of our conference this year. Um, tonight, we hope to further some of the conversations we've had from the last couple of nights. We heard yesterday about um, the incredible health benefits that modulators, in particular Cafeterio, has brought to people with CF who are eligible for them. Um, we also heard very moving testimony from a panel of people with CF about the impact that these drugs have had on their day-to-day -day lives and their ability to plan for the future, to start families and to have careers. Um, but we also heard about the individual nature of CF. Um, and how some of these therapies don't have the same impact for everyone, and that there remains a group of people who are still ineligible for any of the therapies due to their rare mutations. And tonight we hope to discuss um, how research, the important role that research can play in identifying and developing new therapeutic options for CF, and also the role of individualized and personalized medicine, and how it can ensure that everybody with CF has access to one of uh, to an effective therapy. And to do this, I'm absolutely delighted to be joined this evening by our two speakers. We have Professor Patrick Harrison, who I believe is joining us virtually from Portugal. Um, wel welcome, Professor Harrison, and also Professor Kort van der Ent, who's joining us from Utrecht in the Netherlands. So welcome to both of you, and thank you very much for joining us this evening. Just a reminder to everybody that if you have any questions, we will have a joint Q&A session at the end of this, um, and you can put any of your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screens. So up first, um, we have Professor Harrison, and Professor Harrison is a senior lecturer in molecular physiology in the Department of Physiology from UCC. He is head of the gene editing research group, um, which focuses primarily on strategies to correct CF causing mutations in the CFTR gene. And Professor Harrison, you're going to discuss tonight gene editing and genetic therapies. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Sarah. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, take that as a yes. Um, so first of all, I'd just like to thank uh, Sarah and the organizers for the opportunity to, to speak here. Um, I am in Portugal. This is my third cystic fibrosis conference uh, in three days. So please don't anybody be in any doubt that people aren't trying to do as much research as possible uh, in this area. Um, Sarah and Caroline did send me through my purple rose. Unfortunately, it didn't arrive in time before I left, but I've been through the garden here at the hotel and I've managed to do my best to get some uh, purple regalia for my, uh, for my waistcoat here. <coughs> Excuse me. What I'd like to do for the next uh, little while, first of all, was I should uh, start sharing my screen. I've got two talks, make sure I get the right one. Okay, so hopefully you can uh, see my slides. Uh, it's to talk about some of the recent highlights, uh, future goals and therape therapeutic opportunities uh, in uh, cystic fibrosis. So we've had the gene for cystic fibrosis uh, since uh, 1989, and uh, that's taught us an awful lot about the disease. Sorry, just whoops. And, in that publication, um, there was this bit of information. It's called a sequencing gel. And I'd imagine to most people in the room, um, you can't make a lot of sense of it. Um, but on the left-hand side, we've got a uh, sequence from a non-CF person. On the right-hand side, we've got information from someone with cystic fibrosis. The two patterns are clearly different, but you can't get a huge amount of information until you start to analyze the sequence a little bit. And if we just move that sequence on the right up a little bit, you can see that the pattern's now starting to emerge. And if we annotate or label this properly, this was the first identification of what we now know as the f 508 del mutation. The question we're really interested in is those three base pairs which are missing, can we put them back in? Well, in principle, yes, by a technique known as gene editing. And that's one of the topics I'd like to talk about this evening. But what we're really interested in is this. Are we actually going to get to a stage where we have real medicines which can treat uh, F508-DEL permanently in the lung or in all tissues? Can we do this for other mutations or can we do this for all variants which cause cystic fibrosis? This slide here just shows some of the many different options that we've got for trying to uh, treat cystic fibrosis using genetic methods. And I'll come back to this slide uh, a lot this evening. But before I do that, oh, sorry. I do apologize. I've 
uploaded the wrong slides. But before I come to that, I want to start with this slide here. Now you might be wondering why I'm showing a picture of a snail. But um, this is just to explain the challenge of cystic fibrosis. Um, this is a salt wing swim plan. If you look carefully here, you can see water being secreted by this animal here. Now, in our lungs, we don't sprinkle salt on. We use the CFTR ion channel. And this mediates the transport of chloride ions and bicarbonate ions. And this creates an osmotic gradient for water to come out. And in the diagram on the right, you can see cilia beating. We have normal mucus. This collects dust particles and germs and then the cilia beat, and this removes them from our lungs. But in cystic fibrosis, the ion channel doesn't work, or it doesn't open, or it doesn't traffic, or in some cases, it's simply not synthesized, and this leads to the problems associated with the lung in cystic fibrosis. As I've just shown you, um, this is the slide I wanted to start with, the sequence. The question we're interested in, can we put these nucleotides back, is something I'll come into in detail in a few moments. Because if we can, that should in principle um, uh, treat cystic fibrosis at the genetic level, completely eradicating the mutation. But how do we get to these uh, potential medicines? Uh, as I mentioned, this slide here is one which I'll come back to. It shows three different parts of the cell. In blue, we have the nucleus, which is where the DNA is added. Uh, in orange, we have the cytoplasm of the cell, which is where the mRNA is produced and translated into the CFTR protein, which is expressed on the surface of the cell. And the first two therapeutic approaches I'd like to touch on are cDNA and messenger RNA, shown in red and blue there. But to explain this, I just want to do a little bit of molecular biology and remind you how cells work. With the same color coding, blue for the nucleus, orange for the cytoplasm, we have a DNA molecule in all our cells, which gets transcribed into a messenger RNA. And this messenger RNA gets converted into protein. And in the case of cystic fibrosis, that protein traffics to the cell surface. Just a little aside, I'll show you some data on this later. You may well have heard of band B and band C protein. Well, band B protein is a simple way that scientists have got to look at the protein just after it's been synthesized. And band C is when that protein, the CFTR protein reaches the cell surface. And in a healthy individual, most of the CFTR is in the band C format. And I'll mention that again a bit later. But we also know that mutations affect the proteins. They've now appeared as these red lines in the DNA, which gets copied into the RNA. And we've now got this change in the protein. And in many cases in cystic fibrosis, the protein's made, but doesn't reach the cell surface. In this case, you'd see lots of band B protein, but very little band C. But we've got a couple of options which could potentially correct all mutations. And that's shown on the right-hand side here. We can take this mutated RNA molecule, extract it from cells, and we can convert it into a DNA molecule. We can then correct the mutation in the DNA molecule in the lab. We've been able to do this for over 30 years. And then we can use this to make uh, RNA molecules. But we can also take these DNA molecules and insert, insert them into cells. And this is known as cDNA addition. Now we don't stretch the cell, this is just my limited animation skills, but there's chemical techniques to allow us to introduce these short DNA molecules into cell with the correct CFTR sequence, which, which then make the correct CFTR messenger RNA and protein, which then traffics. So this gives us the principle of either cDNA-based therapy at the bottom or an RNA-based therapy shown at the top. And the term we use is that these approaches will complement the genetic defect, but they don't eradicate it. In any cell treated in this way, the original genetic defect is still there and the dysfunctional protein is also still made. But potentially, and it's been shown in cells to work very effectively, either of these approaches could become a therapy. 
But as you all know, the last clinical trial of cDNA-based therapy led by Eric Alton and colleagues in the UK Gene Set Therapy Consortium seven years ago gave this result. And you can see here that the cDNA shown in blue wasn't that much better than the placebo. And on the same graph and the same timescale, you can see it's nothing like the first modulator that we had, Ivor Kafta. Now, interestingly, at this meeting I'm at just at the moment, Uta Griesenbach, one of Eric Alton's colleagues, will be giving an update on this process on Saturday. What about mRNA therapy in patients? Well, there's three candidate formulations in clinical trials. One of them you may have heard of, MRT5005. Um, this looked quite promising last spring in a single dose trial where in a very small number of patients, there were small increases in FEV1. But to date, multiple dose trials have shown no discernible pattern of increase in FEV1. But there's also two other preclinical uh, pre trials which have been completed uh, by two other drug companies, one by uh, Rico Therapeutics, and their molecule has been shown to restore function in human cells. And they're now looking into a clinical trial uh, for this. And Luna uh, humanized CFTR, which also gives small increases in vivo successfully in a mouse model. So whilst there's been no two big breakthroughs with either of these just at the moment, trials are ongoing and hopefully more data will be available in the next year to 18 months for both of these approaches. So we can tick off two boxes on the left-hand side there, but what about other options? Well, what I'd like to go through now are what we call mutation-specific options. Just to remind you, with cDNA and uh, messenger RNA, those treatments in principle should work for any cystic fibrosis mutation. But let's look at some of these more specific options. I suppose really we should look at the mutations first. So here's a list of the top 10 CF causing mutations. I'm sure that you're very familiar with these. You can see F508 at the top there, followed by G542X and so on. The ones in red, we've got good news because these respond in most cases to uh, available modulators. But there's a lot of the common mutations there shown in black, which don't respond. So what can we potentially do about some of these? Well, let's zoom in, three, zoom in on three of them. Uh, if you notice, they all end in X. This means that they're so-called stop codon mutations, which I'll explain in detail on the next slide. Potentially though, stop codon mutations could be treated by a therapy known as ACE tRNAs. Just to remind you, with these stop codon mutations, they um, have a mutation in the DNA, they make a messenger RNA, which is the green squiggly line there, but as you can see in this slide, there's no protein made. So this is one of the reasons why these particular mutations don't respond to the modulator drugs which target the protein. The protein's never made in these particular individuals. So what can we do with these ACE tRNAs shown at the top here? Well, first of all, just to remind you, these work in the cytosol of the cell. So this makes delivery a little bit easier. We just need to cross the cell membrane. We don't need to get these all the way to the nucleus. This is a slide taken from a paper by uh, a group in New York, uh, headed by John Lewick, who's at the conference. I've spoken to him already. He's given the talk on Saturday as well. And this shows the process of process, uh, protein synthesis. Now in this step here, we've got uh, in blue on the left-hand side, a tRNA, which has just jumped, done its job. And on the right-hand side, uh, with a little blue blob at the top, which is an amino acid, a tRNA, which is just about to add the next uh, amino acid to the protein chain. You can see here, the tRNA moves into position, looking at the messenger RNA, which is in the bright green at the bottom. And you see I've listed just two rules. C binds to G, and U binds to A. You can see that rule has been followed carefully there in all three cases at the bottom. So this leads to the extension of the protein chain. And other amino acids are then added following the genetic code. But look carefully now at those three nucleotides in red. When we have a stop code on mutation, we get a single nucleotide change. And this means now that we can't uh, translate this. There's no transfer RNA in the cells, which is capable of recognizing this. 
Transfer RNAs with the wrong sequence may well come in and try, but you can see they don't follow all the rules and they get rejected. So the protein can't be fully synthesized and this leads to the uh, cystic fibrosis in people with these mutations. But John Lewitt's group have done this. If you look very carefully at the three letters in green there, oops, they, if you look very carefully at the three nucleotides in green there, John's group have come up with a technique to modify one of those nucleotides such that now it has an A and it can follow the rules. It base pairs as it should, and it now can position an, a, 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 an amino acid into the protein chain and allow the protein to be fully synthesized. So John's been working on this for a couple of years now. And this is a paper from two years ago where they showed that they could correct in cells the G542X mutation, the second most common CFTR mutation, and W1282X, the fourth most common mutation. So John's now working with a pharmaceutical company to see if it's possible to get these molecules into preclinical studies and hopefully to be tested in the not too distant future in people with these particular mutations. Next on the list, we've got RNA editing. I'll just very briefly explain the principle of RNA editing, but I won't talk too much about it because it's still fairly early in development. RNA editing is a technique which allows you to change the sequence of a messenger RNA molecule. So rather than trying to fix the transfer RNA, this would potentially allow you to correct the RNA molecule sequence itself. The only limitation with that at the moment is that the DNA would still have the mutation so you would have to keep repeating this process uh, regularly because the DNA would keep making uh, RNA molecules which have this fault which need to be fixed, which is why I'm gonna talk later about DNA editing, which would get around this problem. Next topic I want to move on to then now is one of the first ones which is in the nucleus of the cell. And this is the use of SSODNs, single-stranded olig oligodeoxynucleotides, they're also called um, AONs as well. And the way that these work is on this intermediate molecule, HNRNA. So let's have a look at this. I'll just step aside slightly for a second and look at a different disease, muscular dystrophy. And the point I want to make here is that this approach has been used in muscular dystrophy. It's been used in the lab, it's been used in animal models, and there's not just one, but four licensed medicines for certain types of CF, uh, DMD mutations. So what can we do for cystic fibrosis? Well, for the vast majority of cystic fibrosis mutations, this wouldn't work. But for these three mutations here, 3849 plus 10 KB being in the top 10, and two of the mutations which some of you may have heard of, this approach could potentially work. And this isn't a new idea either. If we just focus on the 3849 mutation on the right-hand side, as far back as 1999, Friedman and colleagues did this simple experiment. If you look on the right there, you can see what the problem is. The mutation in the middle of an intron causes misplicing, and this leads to a disruption of the messenger RNA and a disruption of the protein. But either just before that exon which has been added in green or just after in red, you can use these short oligonucleotides to try and block these so-called splice sites. And this should shift the production of that messenger RNA in blue, which has got three subunits, to a messenger RNA at the bottom, which has just got two subunits. You may find these gels a little bit difficult to interpret, but if you look at the one on the left-hand side, in green, the more of this molecule that they added, when they got to a certain level here, they started to see the appearance of this shorter wild type or corrected messenger RNA. Now that was 23 years ago, but this morning, Betsheva Karem, the last author on this paper, announced details of phase one clinical trials to be conducted towards the end of this year for the 3849 mutation, and also a strategy similar to this for the W1282X to start early next year. So it's taken quite some time. A lot of groups have worked on this, but Bersheva's group and her company Splice Sense are now hoping to move uh, forward with this approach. 
So that's SSODMs. Let's move on to what I really want to talk about this evening, which is now editing. Can we make permanent changes in these cells? Well, let's look at, for a moment again at these mutations now in a slightly different format. These are the mutations shown in the context of the genetic uh, sequence. Some of the ones I've shown there uh, boxed in red, we've got medications for, we can remove those from the list, but we know that we've got an awful lot of other cystic fibrosis mutations. Just the list on the left there, you may recognize some of these mutations. These are mutations in the CFTR2 database, which have been shown to be CF causing. There's over 380 of these, which have been cataloged uh, to date. And in fairness, I think we'll just leave this list run for a few seconds, just to acknowledge everybody with these variants. But the thing about these variants, when we start thinking at the protein level, they are acting lots of different ways. But if we look at the DNA level, they're all pretty much the same. They're just single nucleotide changes in the vast majority of cases, small insertions or deletions in others. So can we actually fix the DNA sequence? This is what gene editing is all about. In 2005, the front cover of Nature had this headline, Genome Editing, Rewriting the Rules for Gene Therapy. I read this article on the day it came out, showed it to a PhD student in my lab in Cork, and the next day we started working on this approach for cystic fibrosis. Now, people often give talks and go through all the machinations of the different uh, difficulties with the techniques, and people often end by saying, when will this ever reach the clinic? Well, gene editing has already been in the clinic for seven years. Gene edited cells, and I should stress, sorry, not for cystic fibrosis, but for other diseases. Gene edited cells saved the life of this young girl in 2015 uh, from a rare form of cancer. Brian Maddow, shown on the right there, was the first person to receive a different form of gene editing in 2017. Unfortunately, it wasn't successful in his case, but he also, we also realized that there were no serious adverse effects from this approach upon this treatment. There's also two clinical trials for CRISPR gene editing, which have now been uh, ongoing. I'll talk a bit more about this one later. <coughs> Excuse me. And a second clinical trial where data has already been published, which I'd just like to briefly explain. I just want to show these examples because we can learn a lot about this for trying to develop gene editing for cystic fibrosis. <coughs> I'll come back to the details of this in a moment. But on the right hand side, we've got a cartoon representing what's actually being infused into the patient. We've got two RNA molecules, which we know we can get into cells. We know it's safe. One of them encodes the Cas9 protein, which I'll talk about in detail in a few minutes. The other, a guide RNA molecule. These were infused into patients in this disease. And if you look on the top left there, you can see these particles in the blood, which then escape from the circulatory system and enter cells in the liver. They then make the Cas9 protein, which migrates into the nucleus of these cells and then attacks the gene, which is causing the problem in this particular disease and disrupts it permanently. What you can see in this graph is the more editing was applied, the more of a reduction in the protein which was causing the problem was achieved. This was tested initially in animals and then non-human primates and was very successful. And it's now been used in three patients in a small clinical trial, which was published in the New England Journal of Medicine last year. But what about cystic fibrosis editing? Is it just these fancy diagrams? Or can we actually do something about this in the lab and ultimately in the clinic? Well, to do this, we need to understand a little bit more about DNA. It's the same rules I've already explained. There's four nucleotides in DNA and they always come as a pair. It's either G and C together or A and T together. And they're shown in color here. If we go back 60 or 70 years, when Watson and Crick studied DNA, they realized that the sequence and the structure they proposed also uh, provided a copying mechanism and details of gene repair. So bear with me quickly and we'll work through this. DNA is an anti-parallel molecule. And when you pull it apart, you've got a template for making copies of it. This is the basis of the PCR test, which we've had for coronavirus. It's the basis for DNA replication 
And it's also the basis for gene editing. Short sequences combined following this simple GCAT rule and cause synthesis of new copies of DNA. But if we get a break in the DNA, how are we gonna get new DNA synthesized? Well, this is where DNA repair mechanisms, which we exploit for gene editing, come into play. <clears throat> we clear a little bit of a space in the cell, and then the chromosome, which is damaged, can interact with its partner, copy that sequence and carry that information across to allow the other chromosome to be repaired. Well, that's what happens in normal DNA replication and repair, but we can exploit this for gene therapy. If we have a mutation in a cell, we can make a double-stranded break using one of these molecules like CRISPR uh, or talons or zinc fingers. We can then use a donor DNA molecule, which has got the same sequence on either side of the mutation. We call these homology arms. And once you've made that double-stranded break, the cell will re resect part of the DNA, follow that same interaction we've just seen and can, can repair the DNA. Now this is an unusual case because we have a mismatch, but the cell will recognize that and it will fix it for us. So if we can provide the double-stranded break in the donor, we can affect gene repair. In principle, we can do this, but how are we gonna to get to this elusive medicine? Well, there's a lot of elephants in the room which we need to come back to, but let's have a look at four editing approaches before we finish. The first one relates to the 3849 mutation we've seen is about to approach a clinical trial with uh, oligonucleotides. But my lab showed a few years ago that we can actually cut out this mutation and permanently correct it in cells. This graph in the middle, there's a peak on the right where it says ALT. This is the transcript we don't want, and this is the predominant one of people with this mutation. <clears throat> But by using this CRISPR molecule, which can target specific DNA sequences, we can cut out this region. The two ends will join together. And what we observed is in the vast majority of cases, we make, make the normal message. And two other groups have also done this with similar, or in one case, slightly better efficiency. <clears throat> Around about the same time we did this for cystic fibrosis in the dish, another group did it for a different disorder. And that exact same approach is now in a clinical trial for a disease known as Leber congenital amaurosis type 10. So these strategies which have been developed by our lab and others are also in the clinic already for other diseases. Hopefully we can do the same with CF soon. That's one approach. Here's a second one known as homology directed repair. Here's a list of mutations again. We'll look at one on the top right there, 1282X. And I want to briefly explain how we fix this with CRISPR. CRISPR, shown in blue there, is just a protein which can cut DNA. In, underneath it, we have an RNA molecule which can follow those same rules, G and C, A and T. That's all molecular biology is that simple pair of rules. And it can bind to a specific DNA sequence. The protein literally bounces along the DNA looking for a handy target site. And when it hooks on, it starts to interrogate the DNA sequence, maybe five bases at a time. You can see there we've got five out of five match, 12 out of 12 match. If we get a 20 out of 20 match, then this directs the CRISPR-Cas9 molecule to make that double-stranded break, which we need to start the DNA repair process. So we cut the DNA, we resect to give us a bit of space, and then we have two options. We can make indels where the two ends just join together without the donor, or we can invade the donor. So here's a donor sequence, base pattern, and what you see in the donor is a sequence which allows us to precisely repair that W1282X codon. We synthesize some new DNA. We don't need the donor anymore, but we do need to proofread the genomic sequence, which the cell will do for us, and then we end up with repair. That's not officially what CRISPR stands for, but it helps us understand the mechanism. We've done this for the W1282X mutation in cells. <clears throat> and I won't go into the details too much, but in the red box there, at the top, you just see a green uh, peak, which just shows the damaged uh, mutation. In the peak uh, below, you can see a mix of green and gray, and that's where we've partially restored this. 
And when we purify this, we can show that we get completely gray peaks. We've got rid of that stop codon completely in the DNA sequence. And when we analyze the function, you can see at the top left there, we've got the band C protein has now come back in both of those uh, clones, 6.4 uh, and 6.5. And when we do a functional assay on the bottom right, you can see that almost exactly wild type levels are recovered. <clears throat> There's a few problems with homology directed repair though. One of them is that we need a specific set of guide RNAs for each mutation. But it is a very efficient editing mechanism, and it's also a superb research tool which people are using to study cystic fibrosis in more detail. <clears throat> and I want to move on to another technique known as base editing. Base editing is a really exciting way of correcting DNA because unlike the previous examples, it doesn't make a double-stranded break in the DNA, which makes it slightly safer. I won't go into too many details here, but here's the same mutation in red at position six, which causes 1282X. If we use a base editor, we can potentially convert that A to a G, which would fix the stop codon. And then we can just use the Cas9 to make a single cut in the DNA to get rid of the mismatch. We've used this approach. Again, if we just zoom in here a little bit with a magnifying glass, you can see that we've got the repair of that mutation in about 20 to five uh, percent of cells. And again, we can see on the far right hand side here, we're getting band C protein, which in the absence of the guide RNA in the base editor, we simply don't see. So that gives us two different methods to repair this particular mutation. We also see correction at the functional level. I won't go through the details of the data here, but if you just look at this green box at the bottom here, we've restored about 15% of activity. And what's really exciting about this is we've collaborated with a group at Johns Hopkins University in uh, Baltimore. And we're now discussing with them the possibility of doing an early stage trial uh, in humans, possibly towards the end of next year uh, in nasal epithelial cells to see if we can uh, test this uh, in patients. The next example at the bottom here is a combination of cDNA addition, which can correct all mutations, with DNA editing, which gives us permanent changes. This is a particularly exciting combination of these two technologies, which could treat lots of different people with cystic fibrosis. This so-called super exon approach, as it's known, has been proved in principle by at least three groups over the last five or six years. But I just want to briefly explain our strategy here. On the right hand side, we've got a small super exon here, which would correct the mutation 1282X, which is located towards the uh, right hand side or the end of the CFTR gene. We can use CRISPR to cut this uh, donor sequence here and also to cut the genome and this would allow this molecule to insert in. I sometimes jokingly call this cloning by PowerPoint um, because in cloning by PowerPoint it always works first time but in reality in cells it's got a 50-50 chance of going in the right orientation or the wrong orientation. But the neat thing about the approach we use if it goes in the wrong orientation CRISPR will recognize this and cut it out and force these, these super exons to integrate correctly. This will allow us then to produce a normal messenger RNA with a tryptophan at position 1282 instead of the stop codon. Um, there's still a possibility we'll get a slight response with some of the original mutation. But again, when we've tested this with our collaborators in Baltimore, we can see the band B uh, and band C protein. And interestingly, when we combine this with the triple combination of modulators, we can boost the activity by about threefold, which would bring this into clinically relevant levels of activity. The final one I want to talk about to finish my talk then is prime editing. Um, I heard about prime editing in the following way. About two years ago, I got a text message off one of my colleagues, Kieran, and all it said was CRISPR prime. I asked for a bit more information. He said he was at a conference listening to a guy called David Liu, who's based in Harvard. 
who has developed a number of these gene editing techniques. I asked, was it interesting? He said, yes. I had a quick look at the research paper, and yes, it's very interesting. This is the paper, interestingly, published on exactly the same day that CAF Trio was approved. The great thing about this technique is it can edit DNA without double-stranded breaks and without donor molecules, which potentially makes it much safer than anything that we've seen so far. I know you all hate tables of mutations, but let me show you why this is also a very powerful technique. If you're looking at that list, you might think it's a rather random list, but it's over 7% of all known alleles in the cystic fibrosis database. And they're all in exon 12, very close together. And if you look here at these ones, there's four, three mutations which are very common, G542X, G551D, and R553, in a very close region of the genome. And five of these mutations don't respond to any drugs. And potentially, CRISPR prime could fix all of them at once. Let me show you how. Here's that 34 base pair region of DNA. Here's a CRISPR-Cas9 molecule, which makes a nick. But here's the really exciting thing. After we've made that nick, we extend the guide RNA to include two extra potions known as a primer binding site and an edit site. Surprise, surprise, we're following those rules again. A binds with T, G binds with C. But this allows us then to do a really neat DNA synthesis activity. We could fix the G542X mutation by copying here. With the same molecule, we could fix G551D by copying to here. Or with the same molecule, we could uh, correct 553X. And we've got a grant from Science Foundation Island to try this exact approach just at the moment. There's a little bit of tidying up, like all of the editing processes which I've mentioned. But in principle, this should lead to high efficiency gene editing. And the beauty of this approach, if successful, is this could correct up to seven or eight different mutations with just one reagent, which then means it only needs to be approved by the European Medicine Agency, for example, once. So I've gone through a lot there quite quickly. Just to, re just to remind you that we don't do this alone and it costs an awful lot of money, but our lab is funded by the CF Trust in the UK, the CF Foundation in the States, and as I've just mentioned, Science Foundation Island, and CF Island have also funded a couple of my researchers to attend conferences to try and make more links with lots of other groups across the world. You may be familiar with the Path to, Cure, Path to a Cure initiative, where the CF Foundation have invested $500 million to try and make this a clinical reality for everybody with CF. And just if you're wondering what that message on the bottom of my phone was before, it's this. It's a quote from Amelia Earhart. Never do things others can do and will do if there are things others cannot do or will not do. We need to get a cure for everyone with CF and there's an awful lot of people working very hard with a lot of your support to do just that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. I'm sorry, I was so engrossed, I forgot I had to, I had to chair. <laughs> Thank you. That was incredibly interesting and, and really great to see that some of these therapies and, and options are being taken to the clinical trial phase already and, and that there's, you know, we never know what will happen, I suppose, within the next couple of years. It's, it's a really, really exciting time. And thank you as well for making such a very complex topic so accessible and, and easy to understand. Um, I'm, no, I'm sure people have lots of questions. Please do put them into the Q&A if you have them. Um, Professor Harrison, we might leave you now for the moment and come back yep. at the end to ask some questions, but thank you very much.